who hold grudges in Isaiah 43. So let's read that together. Ready? Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. See, that way you have a, a real part in the service. The other thing is this. I wanted to move the blocks out of the way. I didn't know he was going to put the other. Anyone here by the name of Ribby, R-I-B-Y? That's what they say on the back side. <laughs> it says the love of God is for everyone. Were you Ribby or Josephine or Joe or Sam or whatever? And also those two words, hope and love. Hope, first candle. Second candle was what? Say it. Love. God truly answers prayer. Many of you remember a time when the family who lit this gathered right here crying and praying and pleading. One of you guys I never tell you part. <laughs> Seriously ill. God truly answers prayer. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, have your way in our hearts and our minds today. We give you thanks for your word. And we give you thanks for your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. I do not have, as such, a title for my message, though it's printed in the bulletin, that's as good as any. The gift of love will never break. I saw that on the bulletin board, and preacher's already mentioned that two or three times. Uh, Roger has already explained the meaning of Advent to us and preached last Sunday on the gift of hope, saying that hope will never break. And then, of course, today was the idea of love, so strong that it will never break. Uh, as part of my message, I want to say to you, I am ready for some good news. I told Roger at Sunday School, I said, next time you get sick, let me know <laughs> a little ahead of time instead of calling, can you preach, you know. He let me know, what, Thursday or Friday? All right, all right. Roger, I hope you get to feeling better. But uh, I want to say that I'm ready for some good news. We are swamped daily. I uh, hate to even turn the television on. Uh, we are swamped daily with bad, awful, terrible, horrible, devastating uh, immoral actions on a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, bad, bad, bad news. But listen, quite often from this pulpit, we hear uh, these words. Uh, hear the good news. We hear that every communion Sunday. Uh, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and this proves the love of God. The love of God. And this is the good news of Advent and Christmas. God is with us. Emmanuel, we know that. God is a giving God. God is a personal God. God is a loving God. God is a forgiving God. God's love is unmerited. We cannot deserve it. What we do, uh, what our action, we can no way earn it. None of us really deserve it. God's love is universal. It is 
undeserved, unearned, but God loves me and God loves you because he is loved. Not because of us, but because of God. Uh, this is the most important, present, up-to-date, as of today, December 10, good news. Good news. That God loves us. Uh, he loves us, period. He loves all. He is, his love is all-inclusive. No person, uh, no person is outside his love. He may not love our ways, and the way we act at times, and the way we live, but God loves us. I want you to take your finger and point to yourself <laughs> and say, God loves me. Would you say that? God loves me. One more time. God loves me. Now, if you're close to someone, turn to them and say, God loves you. Okay. Now that, I should just have the benediction. Because that is the message of Advent. Recently I received a letter from uh, one of the churches that I served in the past, a large church, uh, well, it's in Waverly, Tennessee. Thad Collier, he's Anna's, one of Anna's boyfriends. Uh, but uh, he told about the time he decided to go home from college. He was a student at Birmingham Southern College in, in you know, Alabama. And uh, he decided to go home for a surprise visit to his parents. And he surprised them okay. <laughs> They were there. Hey, they were surprised. They had a great three or four days together. And he says in his newsletter that prior to his returning back to school, he asked his mama. He said, Mama, were you really surprised when I came in? She said, why, sure. He said, we've had a good time? Sure. But she said, listen, son, it would have been better had you let me know because otherwise I missed out three or four days of anticipation, of expectation, of preparation, or we would have had a ball. And then this preacher goes on to say, I learned a lesson about Advent. <laughs> it is the anticipation. Hey, the decorations, the getting ready, the, the candles, the, the flowers, the word. It's the anticipation of waiting knowing that really Christ is coming. Uh, let me share a few quotes uh, appropriate, I think, for Advent. Jesus became what we are that he might make us what he is. Corey Ten Boom says, and I mentioned this in Sunday school, but this is another quotation. In fact, it's, it's one of my favorites. It said, if Jesus were born in Bethlehem 1,000 times, and not born in my heart, I would still be lost. Just think about that. William Barclay said, the best way to prepare for the coming of Christ is to remember his presence. He did say, you know, I will be with you always. Know that he is there whenever and wherever. Corey Ten Boom, and I mentioned this also in Sunday school class, also said this, connected with him in his love, I am more than conqueror. Without him, I am nothing. It's like a railroad ticket. Evidently, they traveled by rail then in her day, the day. Said, it's like a railroad ticket. I am not good if detached. <laughs> if you are detached from the love of God, then life can be miserable. Well, as long as I can remember, uh, about this time of the year, every year or earlier, people start asking, what do you want for Christmas? <laughs> My wife had asked me that because every time we went to a place and we both wore out <laughs> uh, trying to get around, uh, couples ask each other, Parents sometimes ask the children what you want. The children sometimes ask the parents, what do you want? Friends ask, what do you want for Christmas? 
what do you want for Christmas? And usually it comes down to a materialistic idea of what can I buy you for Christmas? You know, a toy, uh, uh, be like Andy, a dozen mason jars, <laughs> uh, or a mixer, or a chair, or jewelry, or clothing. Uh, several years ago, Barbara Bush, near Christmas time, was asked to give a speech to a group of people, and, and I share this story. This is her story. And it's a story about a little boy that wanted a red sled for Christmas. You may have heard this. Uh, he wrote Santa a letter. He said, Dear Santa, I really want a red sled for Christmas. And he underlined red sled with a red magic marker. <laughs> Every time he said red sled, he underlined it. He said, I will be a perfect boy. I will do what my parents tell me immediately. If you bring me a red sled, underlined again. Remember now, Santa, a red sled. I really need a red sled. He signed it, sealed the envelope, stamped it, and mailed it. <laughs> and then he got to thinking, I probably need a backup plan. So that night in his home, they had a manger scene set up, something like this. And reached over very gently and picked up Mary, figurine, stuck it under his arm and went to his bedroom. And he hid that figurine in a closet under some toys and junk. And then he got on his knees to have his prayer before he went to bed. And he said, Dear Lord, I hate to get tough with you. <laughs> but if you want to see your mama again, I want you to convince Santa to give me a red sled. <laughs> now, he may have had the idea of Christmas mixed up, but he knew exactly what he wanted, didn't he? So what do you really want for Christmas? The family get together like we did last night. We had a Johnson family reunion, about 60 there. Ate too much. We meet every year at the Shady Grove. Used to be school, community center. Uh, which is great when you get your family together because <laughs> you hug them, cry. Remember those that are gone? Uh, health, uh, a new chair, friends, fellowship, acts of being together, acts of kindness, love. I thought of this yesterday when I was trying to prepare the message. What really would I want for a Christmas present? Not necessarily from Anna, because we've already decided she has. I would like to see peace in our world. You think about Jerusalem during Jesus' time and see what's happening there today. Today, right now. I'd like to see peace in our world I'd like to see peace in our nation. No violence. No more school, church shootings. No more senseless, ruthless violence. I'd like to see peace. Not only in our world, not only in our nation, but in our own lives in our own lives. 
And for that to happen, you've got to have a lot of love. Because love is the central thing, the central theme, the central one important thing in our, in our faith. I read once about a husband and wife, and I think it was old Henry or somebody, who, who told this story. It was a Christmas story. And that particular Christmas, they uh, sacrificed their prized possession to give each other a gift. She cut off her long, beautiful hair and sold it to buy her husband a watch fob, something to go on his beautiful gold watch. Well, he didn't know that. (laughs) He, not knowing it, sold his gold watch to get money to buy her a nice comb to tend her beautiful hair. (laughs) See, both of them material and both of them useless. Really. But they were very happy because they realized each other made a great sacrifice of love and caring just to give a present. That's a gracious act of true love. There is no way. What do we get at 12? Uh, No, I got the time. Uh, There is no way to adequately describe love. The best way to understand love is to experience, to receive it, uh, and give it. Love is giving. Love is caring. Love is sharing. Love is unbelievable. Uh, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love is a gift which cannot be broken. Love is possible because of his love. And I I sat up here this morning and tried to get up. I have more difficulty getting around than a lot of people know. I've I've lost my equilibrium. I have to have help getting in a boat. (laughs) But uh, a lot of my equilibrium. But I sat up here and, and just looked out this morning and watched you hugging one another. (laughs) Roger, one Sunday, I think we ought to do that for the entire hour. (laughs) I believe you could do it. And never end. That's that's love. That's caring. That's sharing. That's friendship. We don't have to do that. But you enjoy it. There's a smile on your face. (laughs) And, and, and I believe a smile in your heart, and I believe the Lord smiles upon us when we, when we do that. That's, that's sharing. Let me share an often told story, if I, if I can. An 11-year-old girl in a large city, in a very poor section of the city, poverty area, Uh, came up with three little children with her to the soup line, a line that they were giving out food, sharing someone had brought it in. And she set the three children down across the street on the curb in the shade of an old tree. And she lined up. Unfortunately, she was the last one in line to get the food. Well, that day... The worker said, hey, we've got a lot of folks here. And he tried to stretch it as far as possible. Her being the last in line, when she got to the end of the line for the food, there was not one scrap of food remaining. Not one. Uh, The workers apologized. And then... uh, one of the women said, hey, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have 
a nice banana in my purse. I want you to have it. So the girl took it graciously, smiled, and said, thank you very much. One banana. And here she goes. <coughs> goes over to the small children. And we don't know whether they were her brothers and a sister or just some friends. But they were small children over there waiting for this 11-year-old girl. She goes over and sits down with them, peels the banana, separates it into three equal parts, and gives it to the three children. And as they are eating it, there she is, licking the banana peeling. And one of the women, when she saw it, said, wow, I saw the face of God. That, to me, is true love. True love that cannot be broken. This was love in action. Now I want to change gears just a moment. Uh, we've heard the scripture from Isaiah, comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. And I skipped down to verse 3, and we've already read this, but I want to read it again. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now I want to skip to verses 29 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. He understands. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That word wait is very important in verse 31. Uh, it is a confidence that God will not desert his people. The waiting is what we're doing at Advent. <laughs> Anticipating the Lord coming, the Lord being, being born. Advent. Prepare, wait, he is coming. Well, what do you want for Christmas? Don't be like those who humbug, bah humbug everything, who gather up insults 